This month in the life gets into the art world. With the big girls of Broadway, hard work that fights AIDS. I got my message across, which was a positive being positive. Post riot girls making a scene. People wanted to put their stuff out on a label that would represent them. And a torch song from Harvey. My love lamps, it ain't showbiz, it's woe biz. All this and me on America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine, In The Life. In The Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Collingwood Foundation, and In The Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Frank DiCaro. There are many places in America where gays and lesbians struggle to fit in, but the world of arts and letters wouldn't seem to be one of them. And yet, as many artists working in the business have discovered, queer people are often not recognized or marketable unless we leave our identities out of our art. Over the years, those politics have been challenged by growing communities of actors, painters, sculptors, writers, directors, and musicians. These artists have entered traditional territory and created art that stands for us. Tonight, In the Life rocks the art world. Checking out a lesbian chapter in art history. Once we found a common ground, there was now room for uh, the visual expression of difference. A novel idea in the publishing houses. No one really has been able to do what he's done in the way that he's done it in sort of a mainstream way and a classic Hollywood story. You know, we just have one little change for the rewrite, and um, we'd like you to make both the sisters straight. But first, the Broadway musical Hairspray, based on John Waters' film and starring in the life's own Harvey Firestein, brought 1962 Baltimore to 2002 New York. And in the mainstream business of Broadway, the Hairspray team found a way to infuse their musical with progressive politics, and along the way, transform it into a critical and commercial smash. In 1998, producer Margot Lyon was looking for her next Broadway project when she saw John Waters' 1988 film Hairspray, starring newcomer Ricky Lake and Divine. And my diet pill is wearing off. Tracy, I want you to go to your room and study. I'm from Baltimore. I'd seen it in 1988, but I wasn't sophisticated enough at that point to appreciate its uh, many virtues. And in about 20 minutes in, I thought, this is it. This is what I want to do. Once Lyon secured the rights to the property, the first call she made was to the film's writer-director, John Waters. I was thrilled, especially when I met the people who were going to do it. I chose the creative team, beginning with the choice of Mark Shaman to compose the score, who is someone I've wanted to work with for many years. When I called him about Hairspray, he said yes. She called me to see who would I like to work with on lyrics, and I said, truthfully, I would actually like to write them with Scott. Scott Whitman has been Mark's occasional collaborator and full-time life partner for over 23 years. I said, you know, Mark, I think this is not a good idea. I said, you know, it's, it's, it's way too fragile a situation to go through the ups and downs of creating a musical. And he said, well, let us just try. So we, so we, we, we sat down and we said, we'll write four songs. And if, you, if the tone is right, what you want for the piece, then we'll do it. And it was. I was 
captivated by them and decided to take the plunge. As soon as I knew Mark Shaman and Scott were writing music, they did South Park the movie, which is one of my favorite musicals ever. Uh, I knew Harvey, I knew his work, I knew everything about him, so I was thrilled. And uh, when I saw Marissa, I thought, God, this is perfect. We need a chubby Ethel Merman. Being young and being a character actress and doing comedy and being chubby and just fun. It's just there aren't very many things for me and I never would have imagined that this would come. So it's not even like a once in a lifetime thing, it's like once in like five lifetimes, you know. <laughs> Harvey's playing my mom, but I never even think of it as a man playing my mother. It's just Harvey's my mom. All well, the two of us together have really formed a bond, so on stage it's like so trusting. Like I don't even think that we're doing scenes, it's just we're just having fun together. <laughs> This telephone call came that they're doing a mu musical of Hairspray and they want to see me and I, I said, and I went in and, and I sang and I sang and I sang and I mean, I, I think I must have sang six or seven songs for them. By the time I got home, the call had already come through, there's nobody but you we want. Lyon hired playwright Mark O'Donnell and Tom Meehan, who had just written the Tony Award winning book for The Producers, another film to stage adaptation. She was also able to lure the pair who helped to adapt the full Monty for the stage, director Jack O'Brien and choreographer Jerry Mitchell. In this case also, as with Monty, you try to distill what you think the film is about and preserve that no matter what you do, and I think that's what we're working on right now. Hairspray is about a big girl with big hair who wins a spot on her local TV dance show and then fights to integrate the show in 1960s Baltimore. This is a white establishment. Oh, come on. Listen, we just came to dance. <laughs> That's not fair. It's a story of outsiders who fight for acceptance, a particularly resonant theme for its gay creators. Hairspray is not just about hairspray. It's your size, your color, your race, your, you know, your preference, whatever. It uh, celebrates that in a way. Yeah, celebrate the eccentricities. In Hairspray, every single person is a hero, is the people that are never heroes or heroines in uh, regular movies. So the outsiders always win in my movies and plays. John had also written a musical. His movie is a musical, you know, even though per se it isn't, but it, it all sings and dances. And so it's such a nat easy to write for it, so natural. After two and a half years of close collaboration between the creative team, the book, the score, and the cast was in place, and rehearsals began in April 2002. into rehearsal, the entire cast and crew packed up and relocated to Seattle for Hairspray's all-important out-of-town tryout. It all starts when the curtain goes up in Seattle. In spite of all the work that's been done the last four weeks here in New York in rehearsal, in spite of all the pre-production work in the design, in the cutting of the costumes and the fitting of them, and all of the elements that we've been trying to put together for the last eight or nine months, nothing starts until you get in front of an audience. It's a big circus, you gotta put it all together. And uh, it's not a lot of time to get it done, so it's gonna be tough, but we'll, we'll make it, we'll, we always do. Well, Mark's role there will be with the orchestra and the music, and, and then once the performance starts, we'll both be, you know. Just hey, listen to how the audience is reacting. Let and the audience now tell us what's funny and what works and what doesn't. Many changes were made to the show in Seattle. In fact, this song came out because the creators felt it didn't quite work. When I was just a little girl, my mother set me straight. She taught me what to say and how to dress and who to hate. So that was fun because we actually got to sit in a hotel room with a piano and write a song every night, to, the right one to fit the space. The one that we're now previewing here in New York is our third... The third version of it. Song. We spent every day in Seattle from 12 to 5 writing. The writers wrote, we restaged, re redirected, reshuffled the deck, and uh, tried to get it all, all our cards in order. So when we came here, we were ready to show everybody what we had. After two weeks of rehearsal and three weeks of performances in Seattle, the production returned to New York in anticipation of its Broadway opening. About a week before the show opens, in theory, it will freeze, which means no more changes in blocking or dialogue, so the actors can become confident with what they're doing rather than 
uh, feel around for which version of the script they're going to be doing tonight. After two more weeks of fine-tuning the show in New York and almost four weeks of preview performances, the entire team was ready for their big night. Well, this is it. Three years after lead producer Margot Lyon first had the concept of making Hairspray the movie into Hairspray the musical, it all comes down to tonight, opening night on Broadway. How do you think New York will react to Hairspray? I think New York has already given Hairspray a great big hug. It's just a dream come true, obviously, as a couple as well. I mean, it's been unbelievable. How many gay people does it take to put on a music? Okay. Well, at least these two. By the end of the evening, it was clear that Hairspray was going to be a big hit. It's really a big compliment to the film and, and to the work we did 14 years ago, and it's, it's, it's thrilling to see it on stage, and it's, it's a great show. They really did a great job. It was one of the highlights of my life, I think. I mean, I look back, you don't get many of these in your career. These are all my dreams, you know? It's, it's quite a ride. In June 2003, Hairspray won eight Tony Awards, including Best Musical. In the two years since its opening night, the $10.5 million show has grossed over $40 million. Something I remember that kind of influenced me when I was growing up was uh, going to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show. We were in Tacoma, Washington, and besides the fact that it was the only thing open past midnight, the fact that it has this sort of freewheeling, anything goes sexuality about it, I remember that being pretty eye-opening and revolutionary. I don't know, when they start on those big lips and it's singing and it just sort of represented all free freedom to me and that you can do anything you want and be anybody you want and, and there's not a judgment attached to that. There's no judgment in that movie and I, I think that influenced uh, the way I feel about being gay now. I'm Bill Brocktrip and you're watching America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine in the life. Hairspray injects a gay sensibility into the old-fashioned Broadway musical. And by returning to his own traditional roots, the Pueblo Indian artist Kevin Cata found a voice to tell his story, the story of a gay man living with AIDS. I've always done art all my life since I was a child. But it became a therapy for me after I developed HIV. It's a miracle combo, good water and good medicine. My mother, she's Irish. My father is from the Tewa branch of the Pueblos. Kevin is Irish and Kata is Native American. But, you know, everybody in San Francisco has a fake name. So I'd like to be known as Mushka. When I first came out, I caught just the barely tail end of that wild, rampant sex, 70s, going into the 80s kind of thing. Deep down, I probably feel that's probably when I contracted HIV. I just didn't get symptomatic until 1994. When I got sick, I developed cancer, and I got spots all over my body. After that, I was laid up in bed for five months, having injections and just trying to get rid of this awful staph infection. It was in my brain, in my heart. I've been close to death four times where I've really, you know, I'm, my T cells have gotten down to as low as four. Right before I got sick, I started doing what I wanted, which was working in interior design. Two weeks later, I was standing in the welfare line because I'd lost all my strength. I felt burnt and I felt gypped out of life. I had to get rid of that attitude. I did art. It was my method of coping. I said, you got yourself into this mess. Get yourself out of it, you know? And you have talent. Those fingers, use them. Get busy, stop moping, stop using them to pick up tissue and wipe your eyes and start using them to make something that's gonna open somebody else's eyes up. That's just waiting to be made into a sculpture. I love using natural objects because part of the fun is going to find the natural objects. 
Oh, here we go. Halo, halo action. All this is disregarded stuff that I find on the street. Kachinas to me are representing different spiritual aspects of my emotions that come out. Kachina dolls are Native American spirit deities. I just kind of wanted to use some traditional ideals with some modern. The anthrax scare came out and all of a sudden this was very appropriate, the whole goggle and mask kind of thing. This one is called the Master Kachina. This one's called the Trick because some trick left his glove at my house one night. I've even had people tell me, oh, that looks like my ex-boyfriend. I'm like, oh my God, I'm scared for you. <laughs> this one is one of my favorite kachinas that I've made, and I call this one the Two-Spirit because it represents both male and female. This side is obviously the male. You turn it over, and then you get the female aspect of the Two-Spirit. It's just got all the elements of, of being a, na a Native American gay man. When I was young, like throughout my life, I would take trips and go visit my grandmother, who lives in a beautiful adobe house in San Juan Pueblo on the Rio Grande River. My grandmother's now 95. All my relatives from my father's side live there. Kevin comes from a family, a uh, long line of uh, family uh, members who have done uh, some uh, artwork. Even though he grew up in, in the city and uh, in California, he always appreciated his Indian ancestry. My grandmother influenced me as far as my native culture goes. She's a very well-known potter. I love the traditional Pueblo designs, a lot of them that they use for their pottery. I like to incorporate that in my art. I like to kind of use a little bit of modern culture and a little bit of, you know, the old. When I started the HIV pill art, I was changing my regiments and I had a huge bottle of pills left over and I felt that I shouldn't be throwing these out. So my first piece was made with AZT pills and I brought the piece to the hospital and I showed the doctors what I had done with the pills that were no longer good. And I got such great feedback from everybody that I thought, well, maybe this is something. I think it looks really sacred in a way. It's, at times, Western medicine to me seems just so harsh and it's so intrusive. And that piece puts it in a little bit of a different place for me. I brought all those pieces to the Gay Games in Amsterdam in 1998. It was the most amazing show. People came and they cried and they laughed. And I actually sold a bunch of things. But the important thing was that I got my message across, which was a positive being positive. I was really honored at the end of it all when they gave me the Medal of Honor. This is a reminder of what I've achieved. The most healing part is to see somebody light up after they look at my art and say, wow, you know, that's, that's really beautiful. How do you do that? I've touched death almost four different times. I had a weird out of body experience. I, I felt like I went to a different plane. Look at me now, I, I'm literally on top of the world. I just didn't want to let go. I didn't want to let go. And I said, I'm not going. You know, hey, I know what you guys think and I can't speak right now but I ain't going anywhere. I'm coming out of this coma and I'm gonna be, you know, sipping, you know, lattes with you at Cafe Floor, wherever, you know, it's like, I'm not going, I'm not going anywhere. I'm Rachel True, and you're watching In The Life. 
For centuries, the visual arts have given the paintbrushes to men, and mostly excluded women artists, not to mention lesbians, from the hegemony of a traditional canon. But in recent years, lesbian art history has become a project of reclaiming the past and of recognizing the present. I really believe all art is connected to lived experiences and to life and social political climates. And therefore, how do we look at lesbian art? I think in some of the uh, older artists, and these are broad generalizations I'm making, a lot of their work was more about hiding or about guilt. You know, so you look to somebody like Fran Wynant, for instance, uh, whose early work are portraits of her dog, Cindy. Okay, not her girlfriend. And the background behind Cindy, her dog, is all this kind of, almost like a hieroglyphic language. Well, it turns out that is a secret code that Fran developed early on as a young girl, writing secret poems to women when she was on the school bus. Through the 80s all the way up until the 90s, we're talking about a flaunting of sexual difference. There was more space for it. Once we found a common ground, there was now room for uh, the visual expression of difference. In the Life traveled around the country to talk with three distinguished artists featured in Harmony's book. Janet Cooling, based in San Diego, has had 19 solo exhibitions since 1976. Cooling's early paintings were some of the first images of lesbian sexuality. A lot of my work is based on restructuring art history, okay? Because I hate what it's about, but I love the way, you know, I love paintings. It's a Girl was painted in 1996. I used the structure of a Renaissance painting here to set it up structurally. Lots of stuff tumbling in. After the It's a Girl series, I began really becoming interested in painting um, women's bodies. And I actually became interested in changing my painting and actually wanted to, to work with classical figure painting techniques. And, and I wanted a real different look to the paintings. And on a political level, I was interested in really portraying strong women. You know, you stand at this painting, it's like you're, you're, your eye level middle of the painting is, this, is this cr basically a crotch that you're looking at. It's an extremely confrontive painting, but on the same time, you think you're looking at a classical figure painting. Maria Elena Gonzalez, a Cuban-born artist, has been working in sculpture for over 15 years. Reworking classical elements of sculpture, her work invites a complicated and surprising interaction with form. We met Maria in her Brooklyn studio to talk about the evolution of her work. A cut above was made in 1990. What it is is a stretch of rawhide in the form of a torso. Rawhide being a transparent material, there's obviously something behind it. And here's, I guess, where being a lesbian has to do with what informs my work. My sexual identity was hidden for a long time. You know, I'm very well acquainted with this mysterious aspect of what you don't know about a person. The persistence of sorrow was about loss. It was about my friends that had passed away from AIDS. I took the whole room and changed the, the shape of it into an oval. That whole expanse of rubber had the names of people that had passed away in Braille. Also, these names had a swatch of Vaseline on top. When you touched it, when you read the name, this residue of Vaseline stayed with you for a long time. So even after you left the exhibition, you still had this residue in your hands that brought back, you know, your experience. Magic Carpet Home is the first public art piece that I've done. I used a, an architectural floor plan of an apartment, and the only rooms that I marked were the closets. And what I did was like this undulating surface, which I equate to a magic carpet. And finally, in Boston, we spoke with Deborah Bright about her 25 years as an exhibiting photographer. Deborah is well known for her campy Dream Girl series. Well, the first body of work I did with a sort of explicit queer theme was the Dream Girl series, which was to take old movie stills and to insert myself in them to mess with the logics of a heterosexual love story. 
I remembered watching these as a kid way before I, you know, knew what a lesbian was. Uh, and realizing that, you know, it was this matter of both wanting to be this powerful woman and wanting to be her lover. The Being in Writing series, like with the Dream Girls, which was also an excavation of childhood, this was just another phase, okay, before we can name our desire, what are those signposts along the way that we forget at puberty, you know, when we're conscripted into this very narrow, heterosexual drama. So I want to get back to these more anarchic phases. When I have shown the work publicly, uh, lots of women have come in the space and burst into guffaws. It's like, you know, this huge relief. Harmony Hammond herself has been an out lesbian artist and lecturer since the early 70s. Much of her work incorporates found objects. I feel my work was most consciously lesbian, um, probably not until the late 70s. When I was working with uh, found fabric and rags, I started wrapping these huge forms that were abstract body forms. And then I just wrapped fabric from the inside out, building it out of itself. And so in a very metaphoric way, it was about um, creating my own life moving from the center out. Most of the artists in this book, while there is a kind of pride and a stance in being who we are, no woman, none of, no artist in this book wants to be limited by a definition of lesbian art. Any label is, is contingent and strategic, okay? So in the 70s, uh, when these desires were just being identified and named, of course, you know, people called themselves lesbians that, you know, had a different kind of strategic, um, confrontational, oppositional quality to it that it no longer does in this, you know, 1990s, uh, early 21st century environment. I still want to see all of us go to the center of the mainstream, and I've always felt that way about it. I want to see this work in the context of painting, period. Still to come on In The Life, your typical Bollywood movie. Mom, I'm a lesbian, I'm not sterile. Shh. Not, you have no shame. Your typical top 40 radio hits. I'm very conscious of the fact that I would never make it in the mainstream. And some typical words from Harvey. Damn straight. The second half of tonight's show turns to the political and economic ground that gays and lesbians break by creating art on our own terms, no matter how difficult starting up might be. Nisha Ganatra set out to make a film that almost got made into a different movie. And Elin Harris started selling books out of the trunk of his car and accidentally revolutionized the publishing industry. I had spent about 12 years in the computer field working for companies like IBM, Hewlett Packard, and AT&T. I quit my job, basically, and uh, when I finished the manuscript, I started submitting to publishers, both large and small, black and white, and gay and straight, and the manuscript was summarily rejected by every publisher that I had sent it to. So I self-published it and started peddling it wherever people were, in beauty shops, barber shops, uh, sorority, uh, conventions, black expos, and what have you. That's kind of how the, the whole thing got started. I just think that's a brilliant, you know, strategy. Go to where the women are, the women who read and all that, and get people talking. One of our sales reps in that area heard about this amazing guy who was selling copies of his book in the back of his trunk of a car to um, all these uh, hairdressing establishments in um, Atlanta brought it to the attention of one of our then editors. I called him and I told him who I was and he said, you're John Grisham's publisher, aren't you? And I said, yes, we are. And he said, nothing would make me happier than to be working with John Grisham's publisher because that's what I want to be. Lynn didn't know he wanted to be a writer until some of his friends started dying of AIDS. 
When I was losing a lot of friends to AIDS, I would write them letters. And these would be long little letters about how we met and some of the good times in our lives. Because, quite frankly, I didn't want them to leave here without knowing what their friendship meant to me. And one of my friends, uh, in his final days, you know, he called me to visit and we went to visit. And he told me how much those letters meant to him and said that I had a gift for writing. And he said, you should write, you should write, you should tell our story. Now, when someone's on their deathbed, you, you make promises that you don't know how you're going to be able to keep. But a year and a half later, I, just, I started Invisible Life. Invisible Life, the book that Lynn first peddled from the back of his car, was eventually picked up by Doubleday and is now in its 41st printing. Invisible Life was the start of the One Day Reads of E. Helen Harris books. We remember when Invisible Life came out, I was like, is he gay? Lynn's devoted female readership can be credited for his unprecedented rise to success, from IBM sales executive to literary superstar, an ascension which has become a publishing industry legend. He gets what it is to tell a story. He really writes about self-acceptance. He believes in love, and that is part of what makes this book so successful. The same publishers who first rejected Lynn were now offering him multiple book contracts and six-figure advances. He's one of the few authors we really take a lead from on marketing plans. Um, we, we surely run everything by him. While Lynn's work has been acknowledged by mainstream critics for shattering stereotypes about black gay men, it has also been attacked by gay critics for its sympathy toward characters in the closet. I think uh, my characters are like individuals within our community. Each person needs to make the decision on how they want to lead their lives. If some people choose to live their life in the closet or choose uh, to not identify themselves as gay or bisexual, I'm glad that we live in a country where they're able to make that decision. The fluid sexuality of Lynn's protagonists is not a common characteristic in mass market fiction aimed at black readers. But in pioneering a new genre, Lynn has attracted a wide readership, gay and straight, black and white, married and single. How do you the ladies think that uh, Yancey really felt about Baz's bisexuality? No one really has been able to do what he's done in the way that he's done it in sort of a mainstream way. There had never been a gay African-American romance, as far as I know, that had been published previously. And that, that was a, a dramatic breakthrough. I knew that to get noticed, you had to be telling a different story. You couldn't just tell boy meets girl or boy meets boy or what have you. You had to have a story that was going to intrigue people of all different backgrounds. And the characters that I created uh, identify themselves as bisexual. Some of them didn't identify themselves as bisexual at all, even though they were having sex with men. And, um, and found a huge audience. I found that people were really interested in these type of characters. As his characters have struggled with telling the truth about themselves, so has Lynn. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I grew up in a very lower middle class, not even middle class, it was, it was low, low income. But one of the things that I could aspire to were things that I saw on TV and things I read in books to know that I didn't have to stay in the predicament that I was in as a child. If you asked him if he was gay when I first signed him up, he would say no. I just went into the whole thing with him assuming that he was comfortable with it and was kind of caught up short the first time that I realized he wasn't. For me personally, the writing has definitely changed You know, my outlook. I find that it's much easier to tell the truth about who I am. Uh, that way I don't have to go back and correct anything that I've, that I've said in the past. And I think it's also been helpful in allowing other young African Americans or Hispanics or anybody who's, who's dealing with sexual issues to see that it's okay to say what's so and to tell the truth. In 2003, Lynn published his memoirs, What Becomes of the Brokenhearted. The reason why we were interested in his autobiography is because he has an incredibly p powerful story to tell, starting when he was a child in Arkansas and going on, I think, probably right up to the point where he publishes the first book. The reception of his memoir, I think, will be um, crucial as to how he decides to continue and whether he does any nonfiction. It's always been my ambition to branch out, to not just be known as a black gay writer, but as a writer. And I know to do that, I was going to have to attack different genres and, and write different stories. All nine of Lynn's books have become bestsellers.
I think Ben opened the door to, to the awareness of, of um, gay persecution in, in Germany. Because really, until then, it wasn't known and it, it, it wasn't admitted. Germany, before Hitler, was a mecca for gay life. And um, it was wiped out in a second. It was wiped out in a second. So there is a lesson about taking freedom for granted. The other lesson is that they could wipe it out very easily because while all of this freedom was going on, there was a law on the book that outlawed homosexuality. It was a dormant law. No one paid any attention to it. But the Nazis simply reactivated it. So it also means that one must really, really be very careful about what laws are on the book. And if people say, well, that law doesn't mean anything, you can't pay attention to that at all. You have to change that law. I'm Martin Sherman, and you're watching In the Life. I'm not getting married, Mom. Forget it. I want grandchildren. Are you too selfish to give me that? Mom, I'm a lesbian. I'm not sterile. Shh. Lena, you have no shame. When we finished the script, we decided to go to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, and meet with some companies and see if they would be interested in producing the film. We met with this one company who was like, we love the script, it's really funny, we just need you to change one little thing and then we could get it all going. Why don't you change all the Indian people to Italian people? And then um, they came back to us actually in a couple of days and said, well, they don't have to be Italian, they could be Jewish. There was one other company that was um, really interested and had all of the financing in place and was ready to shoot right away. And they just said, you know, we just have one little change for the rewrite and um, we'd like you to make both sisters straight. That idea of the least common denominator and let's, let's water things down so it appeals to as many people as possible, um, I think it's insulting to audiences. You know, I think audiences are smarter than that. And, you know, what I found with this movie was the more specific I was and the more willing I was to put myself on the line and show a really specific experience, the more universal it was and the more people could relate to it. Forget it, she's straight. Gay and lesbian audiences, I think, were all ready for, like, you know, a movie to move beyond the coming out story and not have the fact that this character's gay be the obstacle and be the central focus of the story. Right. What'd you call her? Dyke. Dyke. That's great. Why don't you just appropriate the culture of our oppressors? Is she Dyke? Is she Dyke? You know, this family happens to be Indian, you know, and, and that's not the obstacle or the main point of the film. And this one character happens to be gay, and that's not the obstacle. Like, no one has a problem with that. The problem is her sister can't have a baby, and she's going to have the baby for her sister, and everybody has a problem with that. Do I have to touch it? Mina and Lisa are exactly healthcare professionals. Christ, forget it. <laughs> you call Rina and you tell her to stop this nonsense. You know, everybody walks out of Chatting Popcorn and says, that mom was just like my mom, you know? Because it's not about being Indian or being lesbian or being of color or being oppressed. It's, you know, all of us have a mom that's a pain in the ass sometimes. <laughs> and. All of us have, you know, the feeling of, of wanting approval. The idea of people only want to see things exactly like themselves, uh, that sort of idea and that sort of thinking in Hollywood, I hope it's not true. And I hope we can prove that it isn't by having films that show something different be successful. In 1977, ABC announced the debut of its primetime satire, Soap. But before Soap had even begun to air, its gay character, Jody Dallas, played by Billy Crystal, sparked a massive controversy, provoking boycotts by groups as disparate as the National Gay Task Force and the National Federation for Decency. Jody, for the record, is a gay transvestite who looks just marvelous in his mother's gowns and who tries to undergo a sex change operation so that he can stay with his pro football boyfriend, but instead the boys break up. He slips into a one night stand with a woman, fathers a child, and after undergoing a legal battle, wins custody rights, making Jody Dallas in 1980 the first openly gay parent on primetime television. I'm Pamela Sneed, and you're watching In the Life.
When women's music sprang up in the 70s, lesbians grabbed the mics and took to the stage with a decidedly feminist perspective. Then riot girls like Bikini Kill dominated the late 80s and early 90s, until mainstream recording companies sterilized girl power and reduced it to just a marketing gimmick. So the girls seized control. They declared a media blackout and shifted their careers back underground with self-produced fanzines. And a new generation took over. Young women in their teens and 20s, whose politics led them to create a do-it-yourself movement. Instead of negotiating an established industry, they founded their own. I'm very conscious of the fact that I would never make it in the mainstream. I feel a lot safer as a dyke musician than I do as a dyke on the street. Playing music is really crucial to our well-being. This is about the cute girls. We had heard enough horror stories about major labels that it seemed like we wanted to just have it in our own hands. Though the DIY scene has managed to stay off the mainstream radar, its vast community has thrived, creating its own culture, politics, and even record labels. Do-it-yourself DIY ethic has is connections to other ways that lesbians have created from nothing something beautiful. So whether that's creating a community, building a house, founding a record label. Mr. Lady Records and Videos is a company that my girlfriend Tammy Ray Carlin and I started in 1997. The name of our label is called Clever Shark Records. Chainsaw started in 87, that's a fanzine, and it became a record label in like 1991. Because there's a lack of other record labels that have any kind of political viewpoints at all, like feminist queer specifically, like that there really was a need for that. People wanted to put their stuff out on a label that would represent them and would let them also have control. We're on the label with a lot of other um, feminist lesbian bands, and that's really important to us. Neither of us really had any kind of business background, so when we decided to put out a CD, we didn't really know how we were gonna do it. What I do for bands is I manufacture their CDs for them and get them into the stores and do some advertising, but mostly try to get magazines to write about them or get radio stations to play them. I'm still learning as I go, even though I've been doing this for like 10 years. I put out my records with Chainsaw because it's so important to support a gay label. We believe in the same politics. And we're family. Not everywhere is safe for queers. You have to keep coming out to the rest of the world over and over again. Just that there's like so many people out there that are really surprised to see you. Like, a queer person up there or like somebody who looks like me, like is androgynous or something on stage and performing and feeling good. Maybe I'm intractable. I think that if I if I did anything in any way to hide that or to not let it come across in my music, I'd just be the biggest liar. I don't think that I would be a performer if I wasn't like somehow performing my queerness. Sometimes it's scary being out, um, especially when we play, you know, Catholic universities and when we play in the middle of, you know, the deep south. Sometimes that can be a little bit, um, you know, maybe we should just play this off in some other way. Being an out lesbian in the music world means that you are subtly discriminated against at every point. I'm very conscious of the fact that I would never make it in the mainstream. I do notice that there aren't a lot of, you know, women of color. So sometimes I wonder if I'm the one who's you know, just weird for like following my passion and doing this and where are all the other people like that, you know. In certain towns, there seems to be a greater diversity in the in the scene, and that makes me really happy. You know, I'm always like, thanks so much for coming to the show. You know, and I hope that 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 will kind of foster more people getting involved. 
While the DIY women are always in touch through fanzines and the internet, they also work hard to come together at music festivals, like Ladyfest. The first Ladyfest was in Olympia, Washington in August of 2000. There's never been a better time to be a dyke than the year 2000. The philosophy behind Ladyfest as a whole is to support the political, creative, and organizational efforts of women and their supporters. The Ladyfest in Olympia raised $30,000 for um, Safe Place, which is the, the women's shelter there. Ladyfest was the idea of a bunch of people who came together in Olympia one weekend um, because the Experience Music Project was doing a Riot Girl retrospective. We talked about the idea of putting on a women's music, art, political festival. Part of what came of that discussion was that, you know, here it is 10 years later and we're all still making music. So um, why is it that there's no place for this to happen? One thing that we wanted to do with the First Lady Fest was make sure that other people could emulate what we were doing in their own communities. I initiated the New York City area Lady Fest um, for 2001. We were the only one to do it twice. It was pretty much all volunteer, and we were doing, you know, 50 hours a week of listening to submissions or advertising, publicizing. So I definitely think overall Lady Fest is getting stronger and more of like a movement rather than just a festival that happens. I've been lucky enough to go to a bunch of different Lady Fests all over the place. It's been really exciting. The live context is is so unique in its spontaneity. Whatever happens at a live show is only happening in that moment and will never happen again. And that is because of the dynamic between the band and the audience. When you look out and you see like a bunch of girls or a bunch of queer kids that are like obviously queer or something, and they're just like having a good time and taking up the space that's there and dancing. And like, I don't really feel like I had that space when I was a teenager. The kids that are, you know, 15 now, they, they go out to the shows and they're just, they're so cool. <laughs> you know, and I think that in a lot of ways, um, the stray kids are the ones who are kind of like looking for something now. And finally, in outtakes, a doubting Harvey. <laughs> There's some funny stuff in there. I'm getting into it. That's a long way back. Why does everybody want to be in showbiz? Could you please help my daughter get a break? I did a lot of acting in college. They said I was great. If I could just get seen by the right people, I know I could make it. Cookies. Why would you want to mess up your or a loved one's life with a career in the theater? Listen to me. I know a lot of actors, and for the most part, they are unemployed, frustrated, and delusional. And those are the pretty successful ones. The really successful ones are usually just depressed, isolated, frightened that their careers are already over. Sounds glamorous, huh? Acting hopefuls spend years in classes studying roles they will never get to play. They spend more years preparing for auditions they will never book. They face daily rejection from agents and directors and casting personnel and even other actors. How many actors does it take to play Hamlet? Eight. One to do it, seven to say they could have done it better. A career in acting involves one of the most famous catch-22s there is. To get a role, you need to audition. To get the audition, you need to have an agent. To get an agent, they need to see you act. To act, you need to get a role. To get a role, you need to get an audition. To get the audition, you... Why would you want to be any part of that? And if you do buck the billion to none odds of getting a job, you then face another billion to none chance that that job will lead to anything else. And if it does happen, and you do become a star, do you know what you get? 
loss of privacy, loss of identity, constant pressure to please an endless sea of fans who care nothing about your happiness and, in fact, would pay good money to buy a magazine featuring the true story of your downfall on sex, drugs, and excess poundage. And then there's the matter of coming out. Do I come out before I'm a star and risk never having a career? Do I come out as soon as I'm a star and risk losing the career I worked so hard to get? Do I come out now that my show is about to be canceled? Do I come out now that the Enquirer is about to print photos of me on my knees in a public restroom? Do I come out now that I'm 85 years old and no one cares what I do in a public restroom? My love lamps, it ain't showbiz, it's woe biz. Now I know most of you are looking at me and saying to yourselves, he's just trying to discourage me because he can't take the competition. To you I say, Damn straight. You have any idea how many actors there are for every role? Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. Out there in the world of actor, model, personal trainer, waiter, masseuses, there is always someone younger, fresher, and cheaper to hire. <laughs> Consider Meryl Streep, greatest actress of our generation. Meryl Streep makes maybe one movie every other year. That's all. Most days and months, Meryl Streep, my hero, can't get a frickin' job worth leaving the house for. So, poopsies, no matter how fabulous you are as Anita in your high school production of West Side Story, you ain't no Meryl Streep. So think about how much work you're gonna get. And money? Recently, I've been able to make a very nice living in the theater. But think about this. My last Broadway show was 16 years ago. That's a long time between paychecks. And I'm a big star who can't get laid. Wait, forget I said that's another whole part of celebrity. Although I pick up a movie or TV show now and then, the truth is that I could not support myself on acting alone. Were it not for my writing, I'd be better off taking inventory in a nice little lesbian bookstore in Vermont. No, my little star hopefuls, life upon the wicked stage ain't never what a girl supposes. Do you know what kind of a schedule a Broadway performer keeps? We work six days performing eight shows a week. That means two days a week, there are two shows a day. One or two other days a week, you'll be called for rehearsals. There are no holidays. In fact, when the rest of the world is off, you will be on, guaranteed. When your friends are going out, you will be going in. When they're enjoying birthdays, you'll be performing. And when you finally are done at night and you want dinner, your friends will all be in bed asleep. You get one week off every six months. Show up late for work and you're turned away and you lose a day's pay. All of your friends are going to a concert. All my friends are going to see you. Your mom's sick, the show goes on. You don't feel well, tough, get dressed. Strain your back, take a pill. Got a cold, blow your nose. Your families will forget you. Your friends will make other plans. The rest of the world has lives, but you have a career. And you can say goodbye to fresh air and sunlight. We vampires of the stage rarely see anything but the darkness of the wings and the lights of Broadway. And have you ever seen a real Broadway dressing room? There are laws that keep murderous prison cells in better shape. Dusty, dirty, dark, moldy. Most Broadway theaters have been around before women had the right to vote, and the toilets are there to prove it. Ah, but the fame and glory, right? You can work on a show for a year, put your whole heart and soul into workshops, rehearsals, out-of-town tryouts, more rehearsals, previews, and finally you arrive on opening night when, with one stroke of a merciless pen, a critic will grind your dreams into muck. No respite, no payback, you're out of work again. And if you think that people will at least pity you, remember that which an unnamed bard once said. Theater is the only business where not only must you succeed, all of your friends must fail. So star mites, you still want to go into showbiz? Yeah, I know. All the sense in the world don't mean nothing when your heart's taking the toll. So to you I say, break a leg. And just in case, Keep the number of a nice lesbian bookstore in your pocket. I'm Frank DiCaro. For all of us at In The Life, here at Rootstein Display Mannequins in New York, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month.
in the life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Collingwood Foundation, and in the life members like you. Thank you.